Travel all over the countryside, Oscar Leyland, Oscar Leyland. Travel all over the countryside, Oscar Leyland, brother. Whatever it is that you want to see, Oscar Leyland, Oscar Leyland. No matter whatever that happens to be, Oscar Leyland, brother. Come on, me in and then join in the fun. Travel all over. This week we're going to take you inside a prison. It's not occupied by prisoners anymore. It was built in the 1800s, and we'll see how rough conditions were in those days. That's here at Dubbo in western New South Wales. Then we travel south to Melbourne to have a look at a very unusual car. The car is powered by a steam engine. We find out how steam power is being rediscovered. Like most people that travel, we carry with us and eat quite a lot of dried fruit. But have you ever seen a dried banana? Well, to find out about banana production and drying bananas, we're going north to Coffs Harbour in New South Wales. We've come to the old Dubbo jail to answer a request from eight-year-old Robert Blight from Rose Garland in Tasmania, who writes and says, I would like the last Leyland brothers to show me the old jails in Australia, how they were built and what sort of crimes the early settlers committed. Well, we couldn't have come to a better place than the Dubbo jail, because here the jail's been restored to its original condition, and it was built in 1887, and I think you'll find that some of the conditions here were, were pretty harsh in those days. The Dubbo jail housed both men and women prisoners, and during its active days, a stay at the jail was certainly no picnic. The large male cell block consists of 16 cells and is built of locally quarried sandstone. The cold stone walls and barren concrete floors of the cells provided the least possible comfort for the prisoners. Although the completion date of the jail seems to be 1887, a great deal of the prison was constructed before that time and it is located in the heart of Dubbo City, directly behind the courthouse. From the watchtower, high above the prison walls, the warders could keep an eye on the prisoners below. The female cells and exercise yard is directly below the tower. One of the first parts we come to in the male division of the uh, jail here is the solitary confinement cells. There's two of those, one on either side. Now the prisoners that wouldn't conform with the regulations of the jail were kept in total isolation from other prisoners and in total isolation from the sunlight. Now to do that, they had this set up here where by there's two actual doors to the cell. This first door was opened up and it provided a kind of a, a light trap through which the, the water would close the door and bring in the prisoners' food, which was only bread and water, the original bread and water diet. With that door closed, of course there's no light here then, the food was passed through here into the prisoner in a totally dark room. This was then closed off and then the water would leave. Now, apart from the fact of being isolated from the sunlight and other prisoners, the roof of this is covered with about 15 centimetres of soil in order to deaden the sound and keep the sounds of the outside world away from the men too. And on every seventh day of their confinement, they were allowed to come out of the cell and do a bit of exercise in the yard and have a normal meal. A walk down the lonely avenue of cells in the male division brings home the harsh, chilling realities of jail life around the turn of the century. The jail was in use until 1966, and to help with the visitors' imagination, the Restoration Committee at Dubbo have recreated a typical cell situation. Dressed in authentic prison uniforms, the dummies represent the normal cell group at Dubbo. Here, prisoners were either three to a cell or one to a cell, but never two to a cell. 
a cold, cheerless place where you can't help wondering what went through the minds of the convicted men. Each prisoner had a drinking mug, tin plate and toilet bucket. The bed consisted of a coir mat on the floor and in winter, five blankets per prisoner. The ceiling of the entire men's block is lined with 25mm thick timber boards to prevent escapes through the roof. And this cell here is a very special cell. This is known as the padded cell. And the reason, of course, is that the, all the walls are covered with this thick padding covered with leather. The violent prisoners were put in here in the olden days. It was the only way they had of controlling them, Robert. Um, and actually, uh, you can see here where it's been slashed. They used to frequently slash the leather, apparently with their bare hands. It was necessary for the local saddler to repair it quite often. And uh, also, the warders had to be particularly careful when they opened the door. They used to try and poke their eyes and things like that. I suppose I just left them in here until they'd uh, lost their temper and cooled down a little bit. About the only break in the routine of eating meals in the cells and working in the vegetable gardens came for the prisoners on Sunday afternoons when they were permitted free time in the exercise yard. Here the men passed the time playing cards or reading books and magazines from the jail library. The remand yard is a high security area where the prisoners awaiting trial or sentence were kept in strict isolation from the rest of the prisoners. Gruesome as it may seem, the star attraction for modern day visitors to the jail is the reconstructed gallows. It has 13 steps and the hangman's rope consists of 13 knots. Between 1891 and 1904, six men made the fateful climb up these wooden stairs and took the drop. Hanging a man is not as simple as it may seem, and for the visitor who wants to know more, there is a complete hangman's kit on display at the jail. It also contains 13 ropes. It includes leather straps for binding hands and feet. And the hanging rope is displayed in the stretching position. The hangman would stretch the rope with a lead weight or sandbag the night before the hanging to make sure it had no elasticity. Once used, the rope was the hangman's property and they were frequently cut into small pieces and sold as gruesome souvenirs. A spine-chilling finish to a story about the conditions in one of Australia's earliest jails. A story requested by Robert Blight in Tasmania. The internal combustion engine has been developed to a pretty high standard, so much so that these days cars come in all shapes and sizes. Anything from four-wheel drives to fairly elaborate vehicles like the campmobile is common for the average man. But we don't hear too much about steam-driven cars, unless it happens to be a Stanley steam or something like that in a museum somewhere. And in fact, I didn't realise there was any steam-powered vehicles in Australia until we received this letter from Vaughan Morby from Williamstown in Victoria, who says, in my job as a reporter for the Australasian Post magazine, I have come across many fascinating stories. Among the most interesting is that of an all-Australian steam-powered car engine invented by engineer Ted Pritchard of Bayswater, Victoria. As far as Ted has been able to ascertain, development of his engine is streets ahead of rival projects overseas. Well, we've decided to take a look at the steam-driven engine and at the car that's installed in. And we're now going to have a talk with Ted Pritchard, the man who invented it. Can we have a look at it? Well, how does, yeah, it, how does sure. it operate, actually? Is it just like a regular steam engine with pistons and all that sort of thing? Yeah, it bears a resemblance to the conventional engine. I'll show you. I see. Now, what we see there doesn't look anything like uh, a regular steam engine to me. Well, uh, I can show you that this is the steam generator here in this drum. That round drum? Yes. That's an insulating case, but inside that there's only half a gallon of water carried as against, say, uh, eight gallons in the old Stanley steamer. The steam then goes to the engine back here. That's Where is the engine itself? Well, that's it right back here, that compact two-cylinder. Oh, I see. Looks more like an accessory than the motor itself. 
Yes, it's more the size of a weight of a gearbox rather than an engine. Does it use a gearbox? No, there's an, enough torque in that small engine for all you need and the engine will reverse so that you don't need a gearbox. The engine will start itself too, so you don't need a clutch. Oh, I see. Now what about the water, Ted? Does it uh, go back in and be reused again? Yes, the exhaust steam comes back here into the radiator which is used as a condenser and the water is then recycled. Weighing a few kilograms less than the regular Falcon engine it replaced, the steam engine is remarkably efficient. It can provide cruising speeds of 100 kilometres an hour at about half the cost of a petrol engine. There is very little to see when the engine is put into idle, and not much to hear either. The noise factor is fairly low, but as this is an experimental car, no attempt has yet been made to make it run as quietly as possible. Noise suppression is a minor problem, according to Ted and pollution figures made in the United States were the lowest by far of any engine tested. Ted invites me to take a ride in the forerunner of what he hopes will be the transport of the future. Well, Ted, uh, how do we go about starting her up? What do we do? Well, you turn the key here. Just an ignition key. Mm -hmm. And then what? Then you put the foot on the accelerator here. That's all? Provided selected forward or reverse here. And what about these gauges here? What are they for? Well, everything's automatically controlled, but there's pressure and temperature of steam, lubricating oil, ammeter, and fuel pressure. OK, well, let's take her for a run. All right. Seat belt on. There we go. We're getting along at a fair pace now. Uh, what do you expect to achieve with your um, machine eventually? Well, we um, plan to get it into production so that it'll be a uh, useful family car, a low pollution in the cities, multi fuel, no gearbox, could be handy in it for small boats or farm tractors. Do you intend to? go on a bit further and develop a Pritchard car, a complete? Uh, we want to offer alternatives, the power unit for use in the customer's car or our own car. And there is a, a model of our own car being built now to put one of the new units in. Now, I noticed that you uh, moved the lever then, Ted. Uh, what's the uh, idea there? What exactly are you doing? Well, um, that, that lever gives you um, forward or reverse, but it also gives a very high starting torque in that position you saw me start in. It doubles the torque for starting and probably it obviates the need for a gearbox. It gives you high, smooth torque. But normal running will carry up all the highway gradients, but it's useful for starting. Now, as we're driving along here, Ted, the thing that's going through my mind is that we must be driving round in a prototype that's cost a lot of money. How much do you uh, estimate so far this machine has cost you? Well, the, this machine, the development work and so on, would be total at about $150,000. So that's the steam pressure gauge here. Um, as it slowly drops, it brings the burner on. You can see that happen over here. The pressure comes up on the burner. It brings the steam generator up and uh, they keep oscillating just to look after everything automatically. They don't worry about that. So in a sense all the driver really has to do is concentrate on the job of driving itself and uh, he doesn't need to worry about changing gears or anything like that. It's just uh, very, very similar to driving say an automatic uh, combustion engine car. Th that's right and in addition without the gears you've got a safety device. I won't do this abruptly but we're now in reverse and you can feel that compression drag but you do have reverse torque for emergency braking. Oh, that's an additional safety feature then really, isn't it? Yes, um, another additional safety feature is that we use um, so-called household kerosene at the moment and that's uh, um, safe, it's not very volatile and you're allowed to store it in your home or garage. Ted Pritchard, like many an inventor before him, has had to sacrifice almost everything he owned to finance the project but by now there is no doubt that he has a viable motor for normal motoring needs. Back at his factory, a giant photograph of the model for the proposed new car represents the look of the future. A far cry from the old farm truck in the corner, the first steam-powered vehicle built by Ted Pritchard and his father. We've almost come to the end of our little look at the Pritchard steam car. 
But it's not the end for you, Ted, is it? It's, uh, it's only the beginning, at least we hope so. This is a new engine you're working on here, isn't it? That's right. This is a drawing of a part of the new power unit. And this power unit will be compact, lighter, more powerful and more economical than the old one. Oh, well, we wish you all the best of luck with it, Ted. And uh, I'd like to say uh, thank you, Mr Morby, for asking the Lanham Brothers. The beautiful banana growing area of Coffs Harbour is a place many have not seen and would find fascinating, suggests Mrs J.D. of Warburton in Victoria. She goes on to say, I would like you to visit Mr Ted Hamey, who is the sole manufacturer of dried bananas. From this scenic lookout, we can see some of the banana plantations, and it's obvious why thousands of people visit the beautiful banana coast every year. The banana coast, as the Coffs Harbour district is known, is the highest banana producing area in Australia. Bananas are big business, and the big banana north of Coffs Harbour is an eye-catching tourist attraction. The district's annual return from bananas is around $4 million, and that doesn't count the tourist dollars. Hundreds of banana plantations carpet the surrounding hills in lush green. One aspect of banana growing that has had little publicity is the Hamey family's process of drying bananas. We found Ian Hamey and his assistant Wayne in the plantation cutting bananas for drying. Harvesting of bananas is the same on any plantation. Each bunch weighs around 40 kilograms. Over 90% of the plant is formed of water. We'll just open the trunk up here and see what it's like inside. As you can see, it's a very cellular structure. In here, all those small cells, each one contains water. Ian, yeah, why did you cut the other one off after you've taken the bunch off? Oh, well, because the plant will produce no more fruit and it'll only die, and we just cut him down for the sake of the mulch. That's... That's only means each plant gives one... Well, each plant only gives one bunch. Is that all? I thought that just kept growing every time. You know, like no. like you get one off it next year. No, the uh, plant will replace itself with suckers that come around the... Uh, that form around the base of the plant. So here we have a sucker here that will form up and, re and replace this tool eventually. Bunch is formed in the um, stem of the base of the plant and it's gradually forced all the way up the stem and it's forced out the top. It's like being given birth and the bunch comes out here. And it's a flower, small flowers can be seen at the end of each banana. Oh, these okay. are the bracts. They, that's, uh, that's the covering here, mate. Yeah, these coverings, they uh, uh, protect the young bananas from the uh, harsh sunlight and after a few weeks they'll shrivel, die and drop off and this fruit will be remained. Those little white things you see in the end, they're almost like a little flower in itself. Let's we'll see if we can just break one off and we might be able to a closer look at him. Just oh yeah, it does look see, like a flower. Just see, you pull him apart, it's like a little flower at the end there. That just falls mm. off, does it? In fact, the bees go after this stuff at times, and I see them on them quite a bit of time. Probably a little bit of pollen in there for all, for all I know. And how long would it take from when it first uh, forms into this bunch to when you can pick them? Oh, five to seven months. Depending if it goes through the winter, it takes longer. This is a more mature bunch, and as you can see, the, most of the bracts have pretty well fallen off, and the fruit is ready for the, to take the sun. It's tough enough to absorb the sun. And due to the fact that the uh, plant uh, bruises very easy, the bunches there, we ensure that there's nothing there to rub or bruise the bunch at all. So we, remo we remove the leaves that are around. Why do they put plastic bags on it? 
A lot of people ask that. Yes, that um, helps mature the fruit and increases bunch weight and makes an overall far better quality um, uh, bunch all around. Mm -hmm. The bananas are taken to the processing shed where they hung in a banana ripening room. Even though Ian's father Ted has had 40 years of banana growing experience, they had to learn how to dry the bananas by experimenting. The bananas are ripened naturally. When brown flakes appear on the skin, they have reached their best food value, the least amount of starch and the maximum level of natural sugar. Only the best quality bananas are suitable for drying. Queenslander Les Black invented the world's first banana peeling machine. It can handle 500 kilograms of bananas per hour. Before Les invented this machine, the Hamies hand peeled all the bananas. The Chinese were drying bananas 1,000 years ago. But it wasn't until 1968 that a naturopath near Coffs Harbour dried some in the sun and showed them to Ted and Ian. They tasted them and decided to go into the business full time. Racks of whole bananas are put into the electrically controlled dehydrator where hot air is circulated for 50 hours, removing most of the moisture and leaving 70% natural sugar. It still takes experience to tell when the bananas are dried enough. Five kilograms of fresh fruit is reduced to one kilogram of dried fruit. The food value remains the same and the price of the dried bananas is about the same per banana as fresh ones. The Hamies are producing about 13,000 kilograms of dried bananas each year, but they are barely keeping up with the demand. The bananas are sold in health food stores around Australia, and as we found, are delicious to eat. Nothing is wasted here. Ted Hamie feeds the skins to his cattle, and they love them. Thank you, Mrs. D, for telling us about the Hamey family, who have developed a unique industry from a very simple idea. Whatever that happens to be, Astor Leyland Brothers. 